Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect and able to keep the body in check with the bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour for forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of God for us, the children of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Sticks and stones may break my bones. Please finish this saying with me, but words will never hurt me. That was our rebuttal when someone said something ugly to us or to hurt us, and it was an absolute lie, wasn't it? The other person's name calling that triggered our response struck a nerve and dug deep. Someone bruised our feelings or made us angry, and we chanted that their words bounced off of us harmlessly, when in fact, they wounded us. Pumpkin, that is the word that haunts my dreams. As a third grader, I was round and red-faced and wore a lot of orange before I knew my color wheel <laughs> and inherited that taunt from classmates. That taunt would cause me to burst in tears and run to the hallway or find a corner to hide in. And, and while my self-esteem has rallied greatly over the years, I promise, it's a word that still makes me uneasy and uncomfortable. What word was it for you? Smelly pants. Those are the words I joined in taunting another third grader named Joy. Y'all, third grade was rough. <laughs> Those words have also haunted me. Smelly pants. I thought it was a way of escaping my own torture to join in taunting this girl. I thought it made me cool. I thought it made me better. I thought it made me safe. Those words still haunt me, too. What words haunt you? Friends, all of us have uttered words over people and had words uttered over us that have cut us to the core and have cut others to the core, and later we wish we could retrieve them. Words matter, and how we use them matter and how we use them over others matter. And the care of others and the care of our neighbor, and the building up or the breaking down of the world and the community in which we live. In our passage this morning from James, 
we see that the writer understood the power of words. He finds himself speaking to a small, young congregation, young in their faith and uncertain. New believers struggling to live out the law of Jesus. I mean, what does it look like anyway? And what does it mean anyway to love one's neighbor as oneself? Last week, Reverend Wiggs introduced us to this congregation and their beginning struggles with favoritism toward the rich over the poor. He shared with us about James' call to a better hospitality and a better understanding of grace. And James continues this week in his sermon with his people. He addresses how their words, how their behavior with their words is affecting their whole community. The words, their intention and direction, and how they fail to meet Jesus' call to an ethic of love for one's community and one's neighbor. And the wisdom of James says that there is power to the tongue. He talks about how the tongue and the words conveyed by the tongue could be a conduit for goodness or a conduit for evil. He spares no words elaborating on that through metaphors to illustrate how something so small and something seemingly benign can have such a powerful impact in our own lives and on our community. He reminds his readers that a bit in the mouth of a horse can guide that whole beast to move. He shares how the rudder at the back of a ship can even be more powerful than the winds that drive it through its sails. And then he gives us his big point. The tongue is a small part of the human body, but it exerts an enormous power. Friends, tongues and the words they communicate are mighty tools that each of us possess. They communicate, words can elevate, and words can devastate. Now, I've shared some stories from my youth, but I bet even the adults in the room today have had this experience more recently. A remark that someone makes about you can help you stand up straighter or can make you slump in sadness and infect your whole day. A small comment made in the morning about how great your hair looks or how beautiful your smile is can change your whole day. And in the same way, some comment made about how you drive your car, about how your hair looks, or could you have tried a little bit harder today, changes everything for you. The community of James struggled with words and what they meant and how they affected everyone around them. James warns them that their tongues, that their behavior, that their words if not managed, could be the very undoing of their faith. It's that important to James. Things that we think are just flippant remarks, just a casual use, a casual word. For James, it could be the very undoing of your faith and your community. He continues and warns them that their tongues could be their undoing and by saying that every kind of wild animal can be tamed, but no one can tame the tongue. He goes even further by saying the tongue is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. 
he reminds us that none of us, none of us is immune from hateful speech. Odious thoughts within us occasionally erupt into caustic remarks. Even though we know what's right and we know what's wrong, we still struggle, don't we? When a comment pops up on your phone, or you read an article in the paper, or someone makes a comment and you know they're wrong, and you know you are right, your concept of what's good and what's not good goes out the window at times. James says, with the tongue we bless God in heaven, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes cursing and blessing. James sure is stepping on toes today. He goes on using another metaphor about how the tongue can unleash destruction as dangerous as a wildfire. Do you ever think about that? That your criticism, that your sarcasm, that your ridicule, that your innocent gossip, that your flippant comment is like the fires that rage across our prairie here in Oklahoma. Something that is so deadly and unstoppable. Jesus says our toxic talk reveals inner pollution and inner brokenness. Jesus says it's from within, from the human heart, and evil intentions may come. Among those things that Jesus lists are slander, deceit, greed, envy, and murder. Slander is with murder. Consider that. Vile words can not only ruin your life, ruin reputations, ruin relationships, they can also be a catalyst for deadly actions. In 2001, the words of a religious teacher 8,000 miles away incited 19 men to get on planes and make decisions that would change our lives forever. Osama bin Laden's words, his twisting words of his own holy text, a sermon given casually, preaching on the evils of the West, motivated 19 people to sacrifice their lives, not out of holiness, but out of hatred. 21 years later, the impact of his words are still felt. A recent study from the Brookings Institute, this is a survey that said 64% of Americans, the highest share ever, said that 9-11 permanently changed how they view the world and how they live their lives. Unless we think we came out of that experience inculpable, the actions and fear caused by those actions caused our own words to hurt and have a bad impact. That same study says that a large percentage, over 50% of minorities, especially people who look like those who flew the planes, say they no longer feel safe going into skyscrapers, mass events, or travel overseas. And because of the same rhetoric that was used in response to the Islamic origins of the terrorists, 50% of Americans participating in the study, believe that Islam is more likely to encourage violence among its followers. 
the same percentage of individuals who practice Islam are more likely to be attacked for their faith. Jesus says, on the day of judgment, you will give an account for every careless word you utter. And for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Words matter. Words spoken out of fear, in pain, matter as much as those we speak on a good day. And if we're not careful, our words can continue to be an undoing. So I guess the question then, you probably have of me at this point, what can we do to harness the harm we inflict? How do we rein in our mouths? An example comes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the 1930s. He was the head of a school of ministers. And believe it or not, at that school for ministers, he was having a hard time with the ministers gossiping about each other, competing with each other, and slandering each other. So Bonhoeffer issued this rule. You can say anything that you want as long as that person is right in front of you but they have to be standing right in front of you. How well do you think that worked? One of the students later reported it was a hard rule to follow, yes, and in some ways it didn't work. They couldn't keep the rule. However, something extraordinary happened in their attempt to honor the rule, to keep the rule, they realized they were being kinder to each other, that they were pausing before they spoke about each other, that they were considering the cost of what they were saying about each other. And even in the times that they failed, each time that they tried again, their work transformed the environment of the school. People were kinder and more honest, They became more concerned about one another's welfare. They drew much closer to one another and closer to God. Now, not many of us have the luxury of cloistering ourselves away at a school. But I feel like this is good guidance for us, a reminder in how we choose our words. But I have a couple of additional suggestions as well. First, as cliche as it might sound, we are people of faith. So it would be right to ask for God's help in the work we do. And to ask that we have the power of the Holy Spirit to know what words to use and the power of the Holy Spirit to know which words not to use. And in asking for God's guidance, choosing words that become healing words, and thoughtfully thinking about how our words build people up instead of tearing them down, healing them, instead of breaking them, encouraging them, rather than discouraging them. Now, I still have some lessons from that third grade class that I learned, some of which I've shared with you, but also from my third grade teacher, I found that these lessons remain true. Ways that we can reign in our mouths, One, think before you speak. Two, listen before you respond. Three, limit your words. Four, mind your tone. Five, gauge your temperament and heart. And six, 
She didn't tell me this one. I just added this. Ask for God's grace and forgiveness where you fall short again and again and again. Like Bonhoeffer and his students, we have to be willing to do the hard work again and again and again. Even if we fail again and again and again. Those students knew their words could harm or heal, and that working toward worthy words was worth the work. I'll say that again. Working toward worthy words was worth their work. And like them, we are invited today by James to do the same. That though this is hard work, and humbling work, it's worthy work for us to do in order to care for our neighbors. Beloved, words can harm, words can heal. Which will it be for you? Amen and amen.